Saurabh and Rustum. An episode. This is a LibriVox recording. All LibriVox recordings are in the public domain. For more information, or to volunteer, please visit LibriVox.org. Recording by Thomas Copeland. Saurabh and Rustum. An episode. By Matthew Arnold. And the first grey of morning filled the east, and the fog rose out of the Oxus stream. But all the Tartar camp along the stream was hushed, and still the men were plunged in sleep. So Rob alone, he slept not. All night long he had lain wakeful, tossing on his bed. But when the grey dawn stole into his tent, he rose and clad himself and girt his sword, and took his horseman's cloak and left his tent and went abroad into the cold, wet fog, through the dim camp to Perrin Wiesa's tent. Through the black Tartar tents he passed, which stood clustering like beehives, on the low, flat strand of Oxus, where the summer floods o'erflow, when the sun melts the snows in high Pamir. Through the black tents he passed, o'er that low strand, and to a hillock came, a little back from the stream's brink, a spot where first a boat crossing the stream in summer scrapes the land. The men of former times had crowned the top with a clay fort, but that was fallen, and now the Tartars built there Perenwisa's tent, a dome of laths, and o'er it felts were spread, and Sorab came there, and went in, and stood upon the thick piled carpets in the tent, and found the old man sleeping on his bed of rugs and felts, and near him lay his arms and Perenwiza heard him, though the step was dulled, for he slept light, an old man's sleep, and he rose quickly on one arm, and said, Who art thou? For it is not yet clear dawn. Speak. Is there news, or any night alarm? But so Rob came to the bedside, and said, Thou knowst me, Perenwiza, it is I. The sun is not yet risen, and the foe sleep, but I sleep not. All night long I lie tossing and wakeful, and I come to thee. For so did King Afrasia bid me seek thy counsel, and to heed thee as thy son in Samarkand, before the army marched. And I will tell thee what my heart desires. Thou knowst, if, since from Azerbaijan first I came among the Tartars and bore arms, I have still served Afrasia well, and shown at my boy's years the courage of a man. This too thou knowest, that while I still bear on the conquering Tartar ensigns through the world, and beat the Persians back on every field, I seek one man, one man and one alone, Rustum, my father, who I hoped should greet, should one day greet upon some well-fought field his not unworthy, not inglorious son. So I long hoped, but him I never find. Come then, hear now, and grant me what I ask. Let the two armies rest to-day, but I will challenge forth the bravest Persian lords to meet me man to man. If I prevail, Rustum will surely hear it. If I fall, old man, the dead need no one, claim no kin. Dim is the rumour of a common fight where host meets host, and many names are sunk, but of a single combat fame speaks clear. He spoke, and Perenwiza took the hand of the young man in his, and sighed, and said, Oh, Sorab, an unquiet heart is thine. Canst thou not rest among the Tartar chiefs, and share the battle's common chance with us who love thee, but must press for ever first in single fight, incurring single risk, to find a father thou hast never seen? That were far best, my son, to stay with us unmurmuring, in our tents while it is war, and when tis truce, then in Aphrasib's towns. But if this one desire indeed rules all, to seek out Rustum, seek him not through fight, seek him in peace, and carry to his arms, O oh, Sorab, carry an unwounded son. But far hence seek him, for he is not here. For now it is not as when I was young, when Rustum was in front of every fray, but now he keeps apart and sits at home, in Seistan, with Zal, his father old, whether that his own mighty strength at last feels the abhorred approaches of old age, or in some quarrel with the Persian king. There go. Thou wilt not. Yet my heart forebodes danger or death awaits thee on this field. 
Fain would I know thee safe and well, though lost to us. Fain, therefore, send thee hence in peace to seek thy father, not seek single fights in vain. But who can keep the lion's cub from ravening, and who govern Rustum's son? Go, I will grant thee what thy heart desires. So said he, and dropped Sorab's hand, and left his bed, and the warm rugs whereon he lay, and o'er his chilly limbs his woollen coat he passed, and tied his sandals on his feet, and threw a white cloak round him, and he took in his right hand a ruler's staff, no sword, and on his head he set his sheepskin cap, black, glossy, curled, the fleece of Karakul, and raised the curtain of his tent, and called his herald to his side, and went abroad. The sun by this had risen, and cleared the fog from the broad oxus and the glittering sands, and from their tents the Tartar horsemen filed into the open plain. So Haman bade, Haman, who next to Perenwisa ruled the host, and still was in his lusty prime. From their black tents, long files of horse, they streamed, as when some grey November morn the files in marching order spread of long-necked cranes stream over Caspin, and the southern slopes of Elburs from the Aurelian estuaries, or some floor Caspian reed-bed, southward bound for the warm Persian seaboard, so they streamed. The Tartars of the Oxus, the king's guard, first, with black sheepskin caps and with long spears, large men, large steeds, who from Bukhara come, and Kiva, and ferment the milk of mares. Next, the more temperate Turkmans of the south, the Tukas and the Lancers of Salor, and those from Atruk and the Caspian Sands, light men and on light steeds, who only drink the acrid milk of camels and their wells. And then a swarm of wandering horse who came from far, and a more doubtful service owned, the Tartars of Fergana, from the banks of the Jaxertes, men with scanty beards and close-set skull-caps, and those wilder hordes who roam more Kipchak and the northern waste, Kalmuks and unkempt Cossacks, tribes who stray nearest the pole, and wandering Kirkuses who come on shaggy ponies from Pamir. These all filed out from camp into the plain, and on the other side the Persians formed. First, a light cloud of horse, Tartars they seemed, the Iliads of Khorasan, and behind the royal troops of Persia, horse and foot, marshalled battalions, bright in burnished steel. But Perenwiza with his herald came, threading the Tartar squadrons to the front, and with his staff kept back the foremost ranks. And when Farood, who led the Persians, saw that Perenwiza kept the Tartars back, he took his spear, and to the front he came and checked his ranks, and fixed them where they stood. And the old Tartar came upon the sand betwixt the silent hosts, and spake, and said, Ferud, and ye Persians and Tartars, hear! Let there be truce between the hosts to-day, but choose a champion from the Persian lords to fight our champion Sorab, man to man. As in the country on a morn in June, when the dew glistens on the pearled ears, a shiver runs through the deep corn for joy. So, when they heard what Perenwisa said, a thrill through all the Tartar squadrons ran of pride and hope for Sorab, whom they loved. But, as a troop of peddlers from Kabul crossed underneath the Indian Caucasus, that vast sky-neighboring mountain of milk snow, crossing so high that as they mount they pass long flocks of travelling birds dead on the snow, choked by the air, and scarce can they themselves slake their parched throats with sugared mulberries, in single file they move and stop their breath for fear they should dislodge the o'erhanging snows. So the pale Persians held their breath with fear. And to Farood his brother chiefs came up to counsel. Gudurs and Zawar came, and Tharabuz, who ruled the Persian host second, and was the uncle of the king. These came and counseled, and then Gudurs said, Herud, shame bids us take their challenge up, yet champion have we none to match this youth. He has the wild stag's foot, the lion's heart. But Rustum came last night. Aloof he sits and sullen, and has pitched his tents apart. 
him will I seek and carry to his ear the Tartar challenge and this young man's name. Haply he will forget his wrath and fight. Stand forth the while and take their challenge up. So spake he, and Ferud stood forth and cried, Old man, be it agreed as thou hast said, Let Sorab arm, and we will find a man. He spake and Perenwisa turned and strode back through the opening squadrons to his tent. But through the anxious Persians, Gudors ran, and crossed the camp which lay behind, and reached, out on the sands beyond it, Rustum's tents. Of scarlet cloth they were, and glittering gay, just pitched. The high pavilion in the midst was Rustum's, and his men lay camped around. And Gudors entered Rustum's tent, and found Rustum. His morning meal was done, but still the table stood before him charged with food, a side of roasted sheep and cakes of bread and dark green melons, and there Rustum sate listless and held a falcon on his wrist and played with it. But Gudors came and stood before him, and he looked and saw him stand, and with a cry sprang up and dropped the bird and greeted Gudors with both hands and said, Welcome! These eyes could see no better sight. What news? But sit down first and eat and drink. But Gudor stood in the tent door and said, Not now. A time will come to eat and drink, but not to-day. To-day has other needs. The armies are drawn out and stand at gaze. For from the Tartars is a challenge brought to pick a champion from the Persian lords to fight their champion, and thou knowst his name. So Rob men call him, but his birth is hid. O oh, Rustum, like thy might is this young man's. He has the wild stag's foot, the lion's heart. And he is young, and Iran's chiefs are old, or else too weak, and all eyes turn to thee. Come down and help us, Rustum, or we lose. He spoke, but Rustum answered with a smile, Go to, if Iran's chiefs are old, then I am older. If the young are weak, the king errs strangely. For the king, for Kai Khosru, himself is young, and honours younger men and lets the aged moulder to their graves. Rustum he loves no more, but loves the young. The young may rise at Sorab's vaunts, not I. For what care I, though all speak Sorab's fame? For would that I myself had such a son, and not that one slight helpless girl I have, a son so famed, so brave, to send to war, and I to tarry with the snow-haired Zal, my father whom the robber Afghans vex, and clip his borders short and drive his herds, and he has none to guard his weak old age. There would I go and hang my armour up, and with my great name fence that weak old man, and spend the goodly treasures I have got, and rest my age, and hear of Sorab's fame, and leave to death the hosts of thankless kings, and with these slaughterous hands draw sword no more. He spoke and smiled, and Gudors made reply. What then, O Rustum, will men say to this when Sorab dares our bravest forth, and seeks thee most of all, and thou, who most he seeks, hidest thy face? Take heed, lest men should say, like some old miser, Rustum hoards his fame, and shuns to peril it with younger men. And, greatly moved, then Rustum made reply, O oh, Gudors, wherefore dost thou say such words? Thou knowest better words than this to say. What is one more, one less, obscure or famed, valiant or craven, young or old, to me? Are not they mortal, and not I myself? But who for men of naught would do great deeds? Come, thou shalt see how Rustum hoards his fame. But... I will fight unknown and in plain arms. Let not men say of Rustum he was matched in single fight with any mortal man. He spoke and frowned, and Gudurs turned and ran back quickly through the camp in fear and joy, fear at his wrath, but joy that Rustum came. But Rustum strode to his tent door and called his followers in and bade them bring his arms and clad himself in steel. The arms he chose were plain, and on his shield was no device. Only his helm was rich, inlaid with gold, and from the fluted spine atop a plume of horsehair waved, 
a scarlet horsehair plume. So armed he issued forth, and Raksh, his horse, followed him like a faithful hound at heel. Raksh, whose renown was noised through all the earth, the horse whom Rustum on a foray once did in Bukhara by the river find, a colt beneath its dam, and drove him home and reared him, a bright bay with lofty crest, dight with a saddle-cloth of broidered green crusted with gold, and on the ground were worked all beasts of chase, all beasts which hunters know. So followed, Rustum left his tents, and crossed the camp, and to the Persian host appeared, and all the Persians knew him, and with shouts hailed, but the Tartars knew not who he was. And dear as the wet diver to the eyes of his pale wife who waits and weeps on shore by sandy Bahrain in the Persian Gulf, plunging all day in the blue waves, at night, having made up his tale of precious pearls, rejoins her in their hut upon the sands, so dear to the pale Persians Rustum came. And Rustum to the Persian front advanced, and Sorab armed in Haman's tent and came. And as afield the reapers cut a swath down through the middle of a rich man's corn, and on each side are squares of standing corn, and in the midst a stubble, short and bare, so on each side were squares of men, with spears bristling, and in the midst the open sand. And Rustum came upon the sand, and cast his eyes toward the Tartar tents, and saw Sorab come forth, and eyed him as he came. As some rich woman on a winter's morn eyes through her silken curtains the poor drudge who with numb blackened fingers makes her fire, at cockcrow on a starlit winter's morn when the frost flowers the whitened window panes, and wonders how she lives, and what the thoughts of that poor drudge may be, so Rustum eyed the unknown adventurous youth, who from afar came seeking Rustum and defying forth all the most valiant chiefs. Long he perused his spirited air, and wondered who he was, for very young he seemed, tenderly reared, like some young cypress, tall and dark and straight, which in a queen's secluded garden throws its slight dark shadow on the moonlit turf by midnight to a bubbling fountain sound. So slender Sorab seemed, so softly reared. And a deep pity entered Rustum's soul, as he beheld him coming. And he stood, and beckoned to him with his hand, and said, O thou young man, the air of heaven is soft, and warm, and pleasant. But the grave is cold. Heaven's air is better than the cold dead grave. Behold me. I am vast, and clad in iron, and tried, and I have stood on many a field of blood, and I have fought with many a foe. Never was that field lost, or that foe saved. O oh, Sorob, wherefore wilt thou rush on death? Be governed, quit the Tartar host, and come to Iran, and be as my son to me, and fight beneath my banner till I die. There are no youths in Iran brave as thou. So he spake, mildly. Sorab heard his voice, the mighty voice of Rustum. And he saw his giant figure planted on the sand, sole like some single tower, which a chief hath builded on the waste in former years against the robbers. And he saw that head streaked with its first grey hairs. Hope filled his soul, and he ran forward and embraced his knees, and clasped his hand within his own, and said, O oh, by thy father's head, by thine own soul, art thou not Rustum? Speak, art thou not he? But Rustum eyed askance the kneeling youth, and turned away, and spake to his own soul. Ah, me, I muse what this young fox may mean false, wily, boastful of these Tartar boys. For if I now confess this thing he asks, and hide it not, but say, Rustum is here, he will not yield indeed, nor quit our foes, but he will find some pretext not to fight, and praise my fame, and proffer courteous gifts, a belt or sword perhaps, and go his way. 
and on a feast tide in Afrasiab's hall in Samarkand, he will arise and cry, I challenged once when the two armies camped beside the Oxus, all the Persian lords to cope with me in single fight. But they shrank, only Rustum dared. Then he and I changed gifts and went on equal terms away. So will he speak, perhaps, while men applaud. Then were the chiefs of your unshame through me. And then he turned and sternly spake aloud. Rise, wherefore dost thou vainly question thus of Rustum? I am here, whom thou hast called by challenge for. Make good thy vaunt or yield. Is it with Rustum only thou wouldst fight? Rash boy, men look on Rustum's face and flee. For well I know that did great Rustum stand before thy face this day, and were revealed, there would be then no talk of fighting more. But being what I am, I tell thee this. Do thou record it in thine inmost soul. Either thou shalt renounce thy vaunt and yield, or else thy bones shall strew this sand till winds bleach them, or Oxus with his summer floods, Oxus in summer, wash them all away. He spoke, and Sorab answered on his feet, Art thou so fierce? Thou wilt not fright me so. I am no girl to be made pale by words. Yet this thou hast said well, did Rustum stand here on this field, there were no fighting then. But Rustum is far hence, and we stand here. Begin. Thou art more vast, more dread than I, and thou art proved, I know, and I am young. But yet success sways with the breath of heaven, and though thou thinkest that thou knowest sure thy victory, yet thou canst not surely know. For we are all like swimmers in the sea poised on the top of a huge wave of fate, which hangs uncertain to which side to fall, and whether it will heave us up to land, or whether it will roll us out to sea, back out to sea to the deep waves of death, we know not, and no search will make us know. Only the event will teach us in its hour. He spoke. And Rustum answered not, but hurled his spear. Down from the shoulder, down it came, as on some partridge in the corn, a hawk that long has towered in the airy clouds drops like a plummet. Sorab saw it come and sprang aside, quick as a flash. The spear hissed and went quivering down into the sand, which it sent flying wide. Then Sorab threw in turn, and full struck Rustum's shield, Sharp rang, the iron plates rang sharp, but turned the spear, and Rustum seized his club, which none but he could wield. An unlopped trunk it was, and huge, still rough, like those which men in treeless plains to build them boats, fish from the flooded rivers, Hyphasis or Hydaspes, when high up by their dark springs the wind in winter time hath made in Himalayan forests rack, and strewn the channels with torn boughs. So huge the club which Rustum lifted now, and struck one stroke, but again Sorab sprang aside, lithe as the glancing snake, and the club came thundering to earth, and leapt from Rustum's hand, and Rustum followed his own blow, and fell to his knees, and with his fingers clutched the sand. And now might Sorab have unsheathed his sword, and pierced the mighty Rustum while he lay, dizzy and on his knees, and choked with sand, but he looked on and smiled, nor bared his sword, but courteously drew back, and spoke, and said, Thou strikest too hard, that club of thine will float upon the summer floods, and not my bones. But rise, and be not wroth, not wroth am I. No, when I see thee, wrath forsakes my soul. Thou sayst thou art not Rustum. Be it so. Who art thou, then, that canst so touch my soul? Boy as I am, I have seen battles, too, have waded foremost in their bloody waves, and heard their hollow roar of dying men. But never was my heart thus touched before. Are they from heaven, these softenings of the heart? O thou old warrior, let us yield to heaven. Come, 
plant we here in earth our angry spears and make a truce and sit upon this sand and pledge each other in red wine like friends and thou shalt talk to me of rustum's deeds there are enough foes in the persian host whom i may meet and strike and feel no pang champions enough afrasiab has whom thou mayst fight fight them when they confront thy spear but oh let there be peace twixt thee and me he ceased but while he spake rustum had risen and stood erect trembling with rage his club he left to lie but had regained his spear whose fiery point now in his mailed right hand blazed bright and baleful like that autumn star the baleful sign of fevers dust had soiled his stately crest and dimmed his glittering arms his breast heaved his lips foamed and twice his voice was choked with rage at last these words broke way girl nimble with thy feet not with thy hands curled minion dancer coiner of sweet words fight let me hear thy hateful voice no more thou art not in afrasiab's gardens now with tartar girls with whom thou art wont to dance but on the oxus sands and in the dance of battle and with me who make no play of war i fight it out and hand to hand speak not to me of truce and pledge and wine remember all thy valour try thy feints and cunning all the pity i had is gone because thou hast shamed me before both the hosts with thy light skipping tricks and thy girl's wiles he spoke and sohrab kindled at his taunts and he too drew his sword at once they rushed together as two eagles on one prey come rushing down together from the clouds one from the east one from the west their shields bashed with a clang together and a din rose such as that the sinewy woodcutters make often in the forest's heart at morn of hewing axes crashing trees such blows rustum and sohrab on each other hail and you would say that sun and stars took part in that unnatural conflict for a cloud grew suddenly in heaven and dark the sun over the fighters heads and a wind rose under their feet and moaning swept the plain and in a sandy whirlwind wrapped the pair in gloom they twain were wrapped and they alone for both the onlooking hosts on either hand stood in broad daylight and the sky was pure and the sun sparkled on the oxus stream but in the gloom they fought with bloodshot eyes and laboring breath first rustum struck the shield which sohrab held stiff out the steel spiked spear rent the tough plates but failed to reach the skin and rustum plucked it back with angry groan then sohrab with his sword smote rustum's helm nor clove its steel quite through but all the crest he shore away and that proud horsehair plume never till now defiled sank to the dust and rustum bowed his head but then the gloom grew blacker thunder rumbled in the air and lightnings rent the cloud and raksh the horse who stood at hand uttered a dreadful cry no horse's cry was that most like the roar of some pained desert lion who all day hath trailed the hunter's javelin in his side and comes at night to die upon the sand the two hosts heard that cry and quaked for fear and oxus curdled as it crossed his stream but sohrab heard and quailed not but rushed on and struck again and again rustum bowed his head but this time all the blade like glass sprang in a thousand shivers on the helm and in the hand the hilt remained alone then rustum raised his head his dreadful eyes glared and he shook on high his menacing spear and shouted rustum sohrab heard that shout and shrank amazed back he recoiled one step and scanned with blinking eyes the advancing form and then he stood bewildered and he dropped his covering shield and the spear pierced his side he reeled and staggering back sank to the ground and then the gloom dispersed and the wind fell 
and the bright sun broke forth and melted all the cloud and the two armies saw the pair saw rustum standing safe upon his feet and sohrab wounded on the bloody sand then with a bitter smile rustum began Sohrab, thou thoughtest in thy mind to kill a Persian lord this day, and strip his corpse, and bear thy trophies to Ephrasiab's tent. Or else that the great Rustum would come down himself to fight, and that thy wiles would move his heart to take a gift and let thee go, and then that all the Tartar host would praise thy courage or thy craft, and spread thy fame to glad thy father in his weak old age. Fool, thou art slain, and by an unknown man. Dearer to the red jackal shalt thou be than to thy friends and to thy father old. And with a fearless mien Sora replied, Unknown thou art, yet thy fierce vaunt is vain. Thou dost not slay me, proud and boastful man. No, Rustum slays me, and this filial heart for were I matched with ten such men as thee, and I were that which till to-day I was, they should be lying here, I standing there. But that beloved name unnerved my arm, that name and something I confess in thee which troubles all my heart, and made my shield fall, and thy spear transfixed an unarmed foe. And now thou boastest and insult'st my fate, but hear thou this fierce man tremble to hear the mighty rustum shall avenge my death my father whom i seek through all the world he shall avenge my death and punish thee as when some hunter in the spring hath found a breeding eagle sitting on her nest upon the craggy isle of a hill lake and pierced her with an arrow as she rose and followed her to find her where she fell far off. Anon her mate comes winging back from hunting, and a great way off descries his huddling young left soul. At that he checks his pinion, and with short uneasy sweeps circles above his airy, with loud screams chiding his mate back to her nest. But she lies dying with the arrow in her side in some far stony gorge out of his ken, a heap of fluttering feathers. Never more shall the lake glass her, flying over it. Never the black and dripping precipices echo her stormy scream as she sails by. As that poor bird flies home, nor knows his loss, so Rustum knew not his own loss, but stood over his dying son, and knew him not. But with a cold, incredulous voice he said, what prate is this of fathers and revenge? The mighty Rustum never had a son. And with a failing voice, Sorab replied, Ah, oh, yes, he had. And that lost son am I. Surely the news will one day reach his ear, reach Rustum where he sits and tarries long, somewhere I know not where, but far from here, and pierce him like a stab and make him leap to arms and cry for vengeance upon thee. Fierce man, bethink thee, for an only son, what will that grief, what will that vengeance be? Oh, could I live till I that grief had seen? Yet him I pity not so much, but her, my mother, who in Azerbaijan dwells with that old king, her father, who grows grey with age and rules over the valiant Kurds. Her most I pity, who no more will see Sorab returning from the Tartar camp with spoils and honour when the war is done. But a dark rumour will be rooted up from tribe to tribe until it reach her ear. And then will that defenceless woman learn that Sorab will rejoice her sight no more, but that in battle with a nameless foe by the far distant Oxus he is slain. He spoke, and as he ceased, he wept aloud, thinking of her he left, and his own death. He spoke, but Rustum listened, plunged in thought, 
nor did he yet believe it was his son who spoke, although he called back names he knew. For he had had sure tidings that the babe which was an Adabaj unborn to him had been a puny girl, no boy at all. So that sad mother sent him word, for fear Rustum should seek the boy to train in arms. And so he deemed that either Sorab took by a false boast the style of Rustum's son, or that men gave it him to swell his fame. So deemed he. Yet he listened, plunged in thought, and his soul set to grief as the vast tide of the bright rocking ocean sets to shore at the full moon. Tears gathered in his eyes, for he remembered his own early youth, and all its bounding rapture, as at dawn the shepherd from his mountain lodge descries a far bright city smitten by the sun through many rolling clouds. So Rustum saw his youth saw Sorab's mother in her bloom, and that old king her father, who loved well his wandering guest, and gave him his fair child with joy. And all the pleasant life they led, they three, in that long distant summer time. The castle, and the dewy woods, and hunt, and hound, and mourn on those delightful hills in Azerbaijan. And he saw that youth of age, and looked to be his own dear son, piteous and lovely, lying on the sand, like some rich hyacinth, which by the side of an unskilful gardener has been cut, mowing the garden grass plots near its bed, and lies a fragrant tower of purple bloom on the mown dying grass. So so Rob lay, lovely and deaf, upon the common sand. And Rustum gazed on him with grief, and said, O oh, Sorab, thou indeed art such a son, whom Rustum, wert thou his, might well have loved. Yet here thou errest, Sorab, or else men have told thee false. Thou art not Rustum's son, for Rustum had no son. One child he had, but one, a girl, who with her mother now plies some light female task, nor dreams of us. Of us she dreams not, nor of wounds, nor war. But Sorab answered him in wrath, for now the anguish of the deep-fixed spear grew fierce, and he desired to draw forth the steel, and let the blood flow free, and so to die. But first he would convince his stubborn foe, and, rising sternly on one arm, he said, Man, who art thou who dost deny my words? Truth sits upon the lips of dying men, and falsehood, while I lived, was far from mine. I tell thee, pricked upon this arm, I bear that seal which Rustum to my mother gave, that she might prick it on the babe she bore. He spoke, and all the blood left Rustum's cheeks, and his knees tottered, and he smote his hand against his breast, his heavy, mailed hand that the hard iron corslet clanked aloud, and to his heart he pressed the other hand, and in a hollow voice he spake and said, Sorab, that were a proof which could not lie. If thou show this, then art thou Rustum's son. Then with weak, hasty fingers Sorab loosed his belt, and near the shoulder bared his arm, and showed a sign in faint vermilion points pricked, as a cunning workman in Pekin pricks with vermilion some clear porcelain vase, an emperor's gift. At early morn he paints, and all day long, and when night comes, the lamp lights up his studious forehead and thin hands. So delicately pricked the sign appeared on Sorab's arm, the sign of Rustum's seal. It was that griffin which of old reared Zal, Rustum's great father, whom they left to die, a helpless babe among the mountain rocks, him that kind creature found and reared and loved. Then Rustum took it for his glorious sign, and so Rob bared that image on his arm, and himself scanned it long with mournful eyes, and then he touched it with his hand and said, How sayst thou? Is that sign the proper sign of Rustum's son, or of some other man's? He spoke. 
but Rustum gazed and gazed and stood speechless. And then he uttered one sharp cry, Oh, boy, thy father! And his voice choked there. And then a dark cloud passed before his eyes, and his head swam, and he sank down to earth. But Sohrab crawled to where he lay, and cast his arms about his neck, and kissed his lips, and with fond, faltering fingers stroked his cheeks, trying to call him back to life. And life came back to Rustum, and he oped his eyes, and they stood wide with horror, and he seized in both his hands the dust which lay around, and threw it on his head, and smirched his hair, his hair, and face, and beard, and glittering arms, and strong convulsive groaning shook his breast, and his sobs choked him, and he clutched his sword to draw it, and for ever let life out. But Sorab saw his thought, and held his hands, and with a soothing voice he spake, and said, Father, forbear. For I but meet to-day the doom which at my birth was written down in heaven, and thou art heaven's unconscious hand. Surely my heart cried out that it was thou when first I saw thee, and thy heart spoke too, I know it. But fate trod those promptings down under its iron heel. Fate! Fate engaged the strife and hurled me on my father's spear. But let us speak no more of this. I find my father. Let me feel that I have found. Come, sit beside me on this sand, and take my head betwixt thy hands, and kiss my cheeks, and wash them with thy tears, and say, My son, be quick, be quick, for numbered are my sands of life, and swift, for like the lightning to this field I came, and like the wind I go away, sudden and swift, and like a passing wind. But it was writ in heaven that this should be. So said he, and his voice released the heart of Rustum, and his tears break forth. He cast his arms round his son's neck, and wept aloud, and kissed him. And awe fell on both the hosts when they saw Rustum's grief and Ruksh, the horse, with his head bowing to the ground and mane sweeping the dust, came near, and in mute woe first to the one, then to the other moved his head as if inquiring what their grief might mean. And from his dark, compassionate eyes the big, warm tears rolled down and caked the sand. But Rustum chid him with stern voice and said, Raksh, now thou grievest. But, O oh, Rush, thy feet should first have rotted on their nimble joints, or ere they brought thy master to this field. But Sorov looked upon the horse and said, Is this then Raksh? How often in past days my mother told me of thee, thou brave steed, my terrible father's terrible horse and said that I should one day find thy lord and thee. Come, let me lay my hand upon thy mane. O oh, Raksh, thou art more fortunate than I, for thou hast gone where I shall never go, and snuffed the breezes of my father's home. And thou hast trod the sands of Seistan, and seen the river of Helmund, and the lake of Zira, and the aged Zal himself has often stroked thy neck, and given thee food, corn in a golden platter soaked with wine, and said, O oh, Raksh, bear Rustum well. But I have never known my grandsire's furrowed face, nor seen his lofty house in Seistan, nor slaked my thirst at the clear Helmon stream, but lodged among my father's foes, and seen Afrasiab cities only, Samarkand, Bukhara, and lone Kiba in the wastes and the black Turkman tents, and only drunk the desert rivers, Murgab and Dejend, Kohik, and where the Kalmuks feed their sheep, the northern Seer, and this great Oxus stream, the yellow Oxus, 
by whose brink I die. Then with a heavy groan Rustum bewailed. Oh, that its waves were flowing over me! Oh, that I saw its grains of yellow silt roll tumbling in the current o'er my head! But with a grave, mild voice Sorab replied, Desire not that, my father, thou must live. For some are born to do great deeds and live, as some are born to be obscured and die. Do thou the deeds I die too young to do, and reap a second glory in thine age. Thou art my father, and thy gain is mine. But come, thou seest this great host of men which follow me, I pray thee, slay not these. Let me entreat for them, what have they done? They followed me, my hope, my fame, my star. Let them all cross the Oxus back in peace. But me thou must bear hence, not send with them. But carry me with thee to Seistan, and place me on a bed and mourn for me, thou and the snow-haired Zal and all thy friends. And thou must lay me in that lovely earth, and heap a stately mound above my bones, and plant a far-seen pillar over all, that so the passing horseman on the waste may see my tomb a great way off, and cry, Sorab, the mighty Rustum's son lies there, whom his great father did in ignorance kill, and I be not forgotten in my grave. And with a mournful voice Rustum replied, Fear not, as thou hast said, Sorab, my son, so shall it be. For I will burn my tents, and quit the host, and bear thee hence with me, and carry thee away to Seistan, and place thee on a bed, and mourn for thee, with the snow-headed Zal and all my friends. And I will lay thee in that lovely earth, and heap a stately mound above thy bones, and plant a far-seen pillar over all and men shall not forget thee in thy grave. And I will spare thy host, yea, let them go. Let them all cross the Oxus back in peace. What should I do with slaying any more? For would that all that I have ever slain might be once more alive, my bitterest foes, and they who were called champions in their time, and through whose death I won that fame I have, and I were nothing but a common man, a poor, mean soldier, and without renown. So thou mightest live too, my son, my son. Or rather would that I, even I myself, might now be lying on this bloody sand near death, and by an ignorant stroke of thine, not thou of mine. And I might die, not thou. And I, not thou, be born to Seistan, and Zal might weep above my grave, not thine, and say, O son, I weep thee not too sore, for willingly I know thou met'st thine end. But now in blood and battles was my youth, and full of blood and battles is my age, and I shall never end this life of blood. Then, at the point of death, Sorab replied, A life of blood indeed, thou dreadful man, but thou shalt yet have peace. Only not now, not yet, but thou shalt have it on that day when thou shalt sail in a high-masted ship, thou and the other peers of Kai Khosru, returning home over the salt blue sea from laying thy dear master in his grave. And Rustum gazed in Sorab's face and said, Soon be that day, my son, deep that sea. Till then, if fate so wills, let me endure. He spoke, and Sorab smiled on him, and took the spear, and drew it from his side, and eased his wounds' imperious anguish. But the blood came welling from the open gash, and life flowed with the stream. All down his cold white side the crimson torrent ran, dim now and soiled, like the soiled tissue of white violets, left freshly gathered on their native bank, by children whom their nurses call with haste indoors from the sun's eye. His head drooped low, 
his limbs grew slack. Motionless, white he lay, white with eyes closed, only when heavy gasps, deep, heavy gasps quivering through all his frame convulsed him back to life he opened them and fixed them feebly on his father's face till now all strength was ebbed and from his limbs unwillingly the spirit fled away regretting the warm mansion which it left and youth and bloom and this delightful world so on the bloody sand sorab lay dead and the great Rustum drew his horseman's cloak down o'er his face, and sate by his dead son, as those black granite pillars, once high reared by Jemshid and Persepolis, to bear his house, now mid their broken flights of steps lie prone, enormous, down the mountainside. So in the sand lay Rustum by his son. And night came down over the solemn waste, and the two gazing hosts and that sole pair and darkened all and a cold fog with night crept from the oxus soon a hum arose as of a great assembly loosed and fires began to twinkle through the fog for now both armies moved to camp and took their meal the persians took it on the open sand southward the tartars by the river march and rustum and his son were left alone but the majestic river floated on out of the mist and hum of that low land into the frosty starlight and there moved rejoicing through the hushed Chorasmian waste under the solitary moon he flowed right for the polar star past orgunje brimming and bright and large then sands begin to hem his watery march and dam his streams and split his currents that for many a league the shorn and parcelled oxus strains along through beds of sand and matted rushy isles oxus forgetting the bright speed he had in his high mountain cradle in pamir a foiled circuitous wanderer till at last the longed-for dash of waves is heard and wide his luminous home of waters opens bright and tranquil from whose floor the new-bathed stars emerge and shine upon the aral sea end of so robin rustum by matthew arlen recording by thomas copeland